Hi, you are listening to Mediation Station, and this is your host, Greg Fenton. Each week, we explore topics and ideas related to the experience of people with conflict and look to promote the profession of conflict resolvers. We are available to connect with at FentonMediation at gmail.com or 647-227-4734. Visit us at our Facebook page to like us and Facebook group page to become a member. Also visit the YouTube channel, Fenton Mediation. Listen to podcasts of Mediation Station on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and on Google Podcasts. Please follow us at our Twitter account, at Fenton Mediation. We are speaking today about men and mental health, myths, and reframing the narrative. And that Chris Ann Manning Ford and Rod Eric Southwell are here for conversation and will be joining me momentarily. We continue to present the program live each Sunday night from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. through Zoom because there is no live in person programming that's taking place at the radio station due to COVID 19 measures. We will engage in conversation with everyone attending, able to listen and watch. Microphones and webcams will be closed. If anyone wants to contribute, there are two ways to do so. One is to see the chat icon as a bubble at the bottom center of your screen for you to click and type in a comment or question and then click to send. Or you can click on the reactions icon that is also on the bottom center of your screen for us to see you, that you take notice of that. But we'll take notice and click the hand icon and you can speak once we open your mic, not your webcam, and then we'll close your, your, cam, uh, your microphone after you're finished with your comment or question. So the show is being recorded for both video and audio purposes and will be available afterward for public access on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts as well. So. Joining me for conversation tonight are Chris Ann Manning Ford and Rod Eric Southwell. And we're going to have a nice conversation on men and mental health myths and reframing the narrative. So thank you each for visiting tonight for our conversation. I know this is actually originally going to be at the radio and it was going to be in late January this year. And because of the uh, situation with COVID, the last two shows of the month of January were actually canceled. Uh, and then, so now I appreciate that you guys have uh, accepted the invitation to return for us to revisit or visit this conversation. So how about you share a little bit of information respectively about your professional background, starting with you, uh, Chris Ann. Okay, so I'm Chris Ann. Um, right now I'm in career productivity management. So what that means is kind of I help people in terms of transitioning in their career um, or writing books that are based on their career expertise. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing a mix of things for the last couple of years. So program management, as well as in the background, a little bit of property management, so mixing into those areas. Um, so, and I love writing, reading, and so that flows into everything that I do. Okay, how about you, Rod Eric? Hi, Greg, thanks for having us. Um, I am a employer relations specialist at a post-secondary institution in Toronto, and I'm also a dormant mediator. <laughs> well, let's unpack that. What's a dormant um, Dormant being, I, you know, I've, I've, I've trained in dispute resolution. However, I haven't uh, professionally practiced in it yet. I haven't really gotten back into it, so to speak. So, Though I, I, I have this strong sense that there's a strong sense that you want to become not dormant, but active. Absolutely. But you know what? I'm having fun. Um, practicing doing it uh, freelance in my my personal life so uh, it's still it, the tools and the skills still come in handy well, they're transferable yeah for sure so how are you 
Rod Eric and Chris Ann. How are you guys connected? Do you want to answer that, Roderick? Sure. Uh, so Chris Ann and I go back to high school, um, uh, Notre Dame and Ajax, and she was one of like the first friends that I had um, when I went there. And um, she was very involved. She was one of those people I looked up to because they were very involved in all the things and the community organizations. And me being like a newcomer to Canada, it was like, it was very refreshing to see someone like so active and just getting scholarships and all this cool stuff. And she even like, she peer pressured me actually into becoming involved <laughs> with stuff. So. Right. And, and now we can't stop Roger because Roger's always involved in everything. <sighs> <laughs> pulling back a little bit these days, but is that, is that a fear? Do you think that's a fear synopsis? Are you showing this back to Chris Yeah. So. I think so. Um, yeah. It was very was also, interesting because I only, well, when did we meet? Grade 10? It probably. I, I can't feel like it was grade 10. Yeah. yeah. So. And being an immigrant herself, I think the other thing that connected us is that she actually understood some of the perspectives that I actually had when there was not many other people, <laughs> you know, to, who right. had that experience of moving from an, an island to, to uh, good old Ajax. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> well, it, was, it sounds like there was a lot of shared uh, perspectives, how you could relate uh, in terms of where you were from. In a, in a general context that when you transitioned here, it became something that uh, you felt was important for you respectively to, and it, it, somehow a magnet for the two of you to connect that way. You, know, you always find a very eloquent way to say things, Greg. <laughs> Appreciate that. You know, it's all about trying to support people and it's not my intention to draw attention to myself. So, you know, it's all about the other person. And speaking of that, as I mentioned, you guys were gonna come on and have this conversation in late January of this current year. And COVID has been affecting all of us. How has it affected each of you? Um, I would say for myself, it's been an ebb and flow. There have been some good moments and there have been some not so good moments. I think professionally, you know, I had to adapt to kind of a new goal and scenario in terms of what I was going to do um, with the business that I run um, because I did lose some clients temporarily because they had to adapt to what was going on with COVID. Um, and then, you know, I try to keep active with a couple other things. So in terms of that, I was very involved in events. So of course, with COVID, that shut down, right? Um, so I think in that sense, it was a bit challenging for me. But in other senses, I think you, you learn quickly how to um, adapt. I feel like it was a time for me that you know, I went back to my more resourceful days to see, okay, well, how am I going to handle this? Um, so I would say that professionally, yeah. Okay. What, Eric? Quite a, yeah, quite, quite similar in terms of the adaption um, and being more resourceful. Like, I, I definitely had family members who haven't worked since, like, direct immediate family members who haven't worked since last year and, and stuff. So those things have been challenging. However, you know, I still acknowledge the privilege I have not just being, like, my work hasn't really been affected. Um, and being in this day and age that we're in, like I, I this is like probably the best time for anything like this to happen from like a, you know, a year perspective, but also from like um, a ge geographical perspective, like we're doing this in, in um in north america right and like there was just a, like a volcano erupted in saint vincent the other day where you know so people have to deal with that on top of the the um the pandemic so we're lucky man i i talk to people from back home all the time and i i just always feel grateful um at the position and the location that, that i'm in 
what you say you feel grateful, which and appreciative. Is there any other sense of other feeling that I don't know? I'm not going to speak for you. That you feel an obligation that you can't help more or be involved in some way. That's a, you know that's a really good question. I think um, I I wrestled with some of those feelings earlier on where I was trying to figure out you know who I'm going to be in this particular moment. Like before I came to Canada, I always thought like, hey, you know, I will be the type of person that will be able to help my family and friends out if anything ever went awry. And um, I was, I had to make that decision, you know, whether I'm going to be that person I always thought I was going to be or not, you know, so so yeah, I've, I've, I'm I'm happy. I think I've I've kind of shown and proved that. But um, it's 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 one of those things where that feeling definitely did rise, and uh, I think we're in a better place right now. Okay, appreciate that. So tonight we're focusing on uh, our conversation on mental health, more specifically on the uh, male perspective of that. Why was this particular focus? something that was of importance to each of you. Chrisanne? Um, you know, in the last, I would say 10 or so years, I've had a lot of guy friends. And so I've kind of watched the behind the scenes of the conversations um, and in terms of partners as well. And now I have two boys. So, um, I, I tend to, I try to be very observant. And so what I would notice is this kind of reluctance to address some of those issues, common issues, but I just found there, there was sometimes a reluctance for men to kind of address their own issues in specific ways. Um, so, you know, that was important to me as well as making sure that I raise healthy young men. Um, yeah, so that particular thing is really important to me because it also affects, not only is it affecting like generations past, but it's affecting for me personally, the generation coming. And then with the impact of uh, the added layer of COVID. Mm -hmm. How do you see that connecting with the mental health matter? I think it, I want to say it's a, it's a, it's bittersweet because in COVID it's like, because there are issues for everyone, it's almost like for certain people, it's, they're more open to expressing them now because it's not as stigmatized as before if every if you feel like everything is going well right um so i've been finding that with covid a lot of a lot of issues that maybe people buried before or were more likely to bury um either they can't bury it anymore or they feel a little bit more open to start talking about. So with you, Rod, Eric, uh, why was this conversation, why is this conversation too, in an active way, important to you to present? Well, Greg, I have a surprise for you, but I'm, I'm a man. So, um... <laughs> uh, but you know what? My world is not about assumptions and judgments. That's... The man part, I totally appreciate and understand and respect. And just by note, <laughs> I'm also one of those. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing, Greg. I really Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we've had this cathartic moment to yeah, really feel a bond right now. Yeah. Um, but no, in all seriousness, I think, you know, overall as as we, we tend as our gender, we tend to focus on, on health a lot and not necessarily on mental health. And even from my conversations like with 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 women and like friends. I'm realizing that they talk about mental health in a way, or you know, like, hey, I'm just going to go to my therapist. They talk about it in a way that's much more freer and open than, than we do. And um, it precludes us, right? Like in, in, in many ways in society, we are the least vulnerable. But when it comes to mental health, I think we're the most vulnerable because 
or socialized in ways that um, counterintuitive and counterproductive to, towards attaining good mental health. Like one of my friends the other day was saying, he's like, it's hard to make for men to make friends as men. Whereas some women might have like a good social group around them to help them when they're going through difficulties. A lot of guys, especially the older you get, the harder it is, right? So it's something that I'm seeing out there that I know that we that we struggle with for, for various reasons that I'm sure we're gonna get into tonight. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's something important as we're, we're taking, we're adding the additional layer of COVID and some of the economic impacts that might be attributed and and yeah, we're we're really like Chrisanne said, we're really starting to see um, it some of that manifesting in other ways that it probably was there before, but it just wasn't as exposed before. So in a way, possibly it's with it coming to the fore where people are speaking a little more, though not sufficiently, because I believe that's one of the purposes of tonight is really to mm. provoke conversation especially about topics that might have been and are suppressed kept below the surface not publicly so with covid also happening that uh, it's brought the issue of mental health more prominently for a topical area to talk about though we're focusing on the men the men's perspective of that and so do you feel in any way, Roderick, with uh, any pressure, especially tonight, I, I, you know, let's be transparent, that um, you are expected in any way to open up and share about yourself? <laughs> I, like, I, like, I, like, I like the way you did that. You just came back. <laughs> um, I'm very transparent, Greg. I have no point. I have no problem opening up and sharing. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm hearing my wife's voice right now in the back of my head, and she's probably saying otherwise. But um, <laughs> can't, I can't keep a secret from you, Greg. Oh gosh. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and me and whoever else is going to be listening. Watching you and now. you and the millions of listeners. I can't. Keep well, <laughs> I wish the millions would be. Well, you know, maybe we'll. You know, if we can create that kind of energy from this, and then when it's posted for public access, mm -hmm. great. Uh, because. I do see the conversations I have on the show, the program each week as opportunities for public education on mm -hmm. topics related to people's lived experiences. And I'm about social change. I'm about putting pressure on traditional systemic practices, policies. I like to be identified for myself as a uh, provocateur, a disruptor and an agitator. And that's my, community mediation world where I really connected with that whole approach to create work to create social change, mm -hmm. focusing on diversity, you know, the range of different perspectives of people and identities and cultures, and ethnicities, and about inclusivity. So this is an area to feel safe in some way, if you want to call it, to be, you know, go to the, your vulnerabilities. I'm glad to know we're in a safe space, um, Greg. And if I could, if I could be so bold as to borrow some of that daringness, you know, I, I remember we sent a few questions. We're, we're brainstorming a couple ideas, and this one was something that seemed to pop out for you more. Was there a particular reason for that? With this topic too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. On men's mental health. Yeah. So a, a good play where you put it back to me. <laughs> having a conversation right hey, hey come on <laughs> we just yet we have a connection and we've had a connection for a number of years I, at the same time uh i do relate to much of the, some of the perspective that you talk about mm -hmm. where these areas of conversation these topics are kept below the surface and they're not talked about yet they have a great impact on society and if only we did talk about them. So as part of my mandate and my purpose is to go below the surface, like the symbolism of an iceberg that we talk about in the conflict resolution world, representing a person or a situation. If you take what you see as being the whole perspective, you know, the part that floats above the waterline of the iceberg, 
as the whole quote truth, we're missing the majority that's below the waterline. And I think that's where people's lived experiences are with regard to feelings, needs, fears, concerns, wants, and, you know, the intention is to go below the waterline to bring to light these unspoken, non-spoken topic areas that can provoke for positive change. And mm-hmm. I think men's mental health, as you referenced earlier, Chrisanne, too, the stigma with that, mm-hmm. you know, men are, are trained from my world of being, don't speak about emotion, don't talk about feelings, mm-hmm. avoid all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it, it doesn't do service well. That's my experience. Yeah. 100%. I agree. So what, what's the difference for you regarding the experience of mental health matters for men relative to women? I know you may have touched on this a little bit. I, I'm really looking to provoke that more deeply. How about you, Chris Ann? Well, as, as the woman here, um, I would say that Roderick did touch on it a little bit earlier about it seems that his, like female friends have a little bit more freedom in expressing their needs or going to the therapist. Um, there's just, there is less, there's less stigma surrounding that. Um, I also think a part of it you mentioned kind of socializing um, in terms of men being kind of taught from birth to kind of suck it up or, um, you know, not to cry or not to express certain things. Um, And even not to, I would say, given the amount of emotional language that women are allowed to use as they grow up, I feel like that's not um, given to men as much um, in terms of socializing. Um, You know, maybe you learn to use anger, like the word anger to express (laughs) like three or four different emotions (laughs) instead of like, you know, the emotion below it, or maybe you're sad, or maybe you're frustrated. But that kind of language, I find that, you know, men, it's like men seem to have to learn that later on in life, especially when it comes to uh, maybe interactions between women more so (laughs) often, where it's like, women are used to expressing themselves and using a bunch of different words and expressing all these different, and it's not even that it's all these different emotions because men have them too. It's just that the language and the fluency that comes with it is completely different. Um, so I would say that's one of the differences I see. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, 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 you know, I'll, give me a sec. So what I even <laughs> want to build upon the point from Chris Han is that from my experience that, you know, there's the stigma and the protective layer that society puts on to suppress or keep down the men men feeling the uh, capacity to speak outwardly. In fact, I believe that society in whatever way creates an, uh, an elevated level through the machismo that mm-hmm. is even more of a force to counter the sensitivity of men coming out to express about their sen- their mental health matters. So it's like they hide with this whole persona of the machismo. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. I think, Roderick, you said something similar. Yeah, go, go, go with that. Roger. Yeah, it was, it's, it's a bit of a cycle, right? I think in, when you talk about from when you're younger, it is you tend to see as a guy, the guys who present more of that, I'm going to use your word, Greg, machismo, yeah. right? Those are the guys who might attain more um, attention or attraction from, from women. But then you get into a relationship and you really haven't developed um, your communication styles and any of that emotional sensitive part of yourself. And that doesn't help because you, you can't, uh-huh. you might get them, but you can't keep them, you know? And um, I remember 
Um, just I'm gonna I'm vulnerable, Greg, as as you requested. <laughs> I, I remember um, a while back, my my wife and I were having a conversation, and she's like, you know, it would be, and I mentioned something. She's like, I noticed that you'd mentioned something that might bother you, but like I don't know how it makes you feel. And you know, it's like to better understand it the way I normally process things, it would be helpful if you can tell me the feeling of that. And I was remember being stumped. I'm like, I can't come up with an emotion to describe. <laughs> you know, the only thing I could come up with is like I'm hurt. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't even vo- vocalize like my vocabulary for emotions was just so limited um at the time where you know, I had to really dig deep and think about what it was that I was feeling at the moment. And I think that's, I, I don't think that's uncommon. You can tell me, you know, was, I don't think that's uncommon for us to, to, to not talk about our feelings. Like you could hang out with your guys and then you might say something. And, I, and this is how we talk sometimes, right? Like, hey, um, this person cut me. Oh, I remember one. This person, I got, I got, a, I got a uh, ticket, and the other guy's like, "Man, I'm, I would be so mad right now." I don't have to tell you, I'll be mad, but it's like you just kind of understand um, that feeling. Whereas maybe women are better at just expressing that feeling, like this made me upset for these particular reasons, you know. And I find more with my female friends, they are better going through the layers of some of those feelings and talking about the context around them. My guy friends, it's not, it's not, it's just like this thing happened. <laughs> yeah, well, what, what I hear from that is that because of the conditioning and the way society is structured and constructed, yeah. it's like, uh, you know, for men not to be feeling safe to open up and share. As a consequence, men are not equipped with the vocabulary, the glossary of ways to express their feelings as well. Yeah with regard to that. I want to bring attention to a comment that's uh, in the uh, section that was ch- in the chat. So is machismo the same thing as macho? I'm out of touch. So who, <laughs> who wants to broach that? Just to help clarify and unpack. Pro- probably machismo. interchangeable, I would say. Probably very, uh... Chris Anz looks like she's thinking right now, so you can uh, yeah. elaborate. You're, I just told uh, you my vocabulary is limited. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I was just think, I, as I was like thinking how to say it, I'm thinking of that, just the vocabulary in terms of like explanation. Um, I, interchange, I would agree that it's interchangeable. Maybe machismo would, be, or machismo, you know however you want to pronounce it, um, would more be um, the description of an entire attitude of behavior, whereas macho would be more descriptive of a specific person. So still containing the behavior, but it's like maybe machismo has a range of other behaviors involved. And so when you display any particular type of that behavior then you would you could be considered macho Mm. would you also consider that possibly there's a distinction for the the terminology of the behavior relative to the mindset for me i'm a believer in mindset drives behavior yep we act based on how we think our attitude Right. So if we have this concept construct within us of our mindset of machismo or macho, that then tr- translates in how we behave. I would say so, but I, I would say that's not independent from kind of a societal view of what machismo is or macho is. And, and it still can be cultural, like, in terms of like different parts of the world view it differently. But I, I, um, I would agree that it's a part of that mindset does come from kind of societal condition. Okay, all right. So uh, what are some of the myths 
or I'll say it another way, untruths that uh, tend to become normalized as truths for men. Roger! <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I appreciate that he's going to put himself out there. I'm also uh, looking for you, Chris Ann, to, yeah. Anyways, Roderick, you go first. I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's just good. You see, um, some of the myths or the untruths about about men, um, is, I think some one of them is that we don't, we don't, we don't feel pain right like the, 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 this like higher pain tolerance right or we don't have um we don't get hurt by things right just because we don't express we may not express them um as outwardly right or um, as much uh, it doesn't mean that it's not it's, it's not something that's there right let so, me even ask you related to your uh, dormant passion as a mediator Mm -hmm. How would you feel about uh, emotion or feeling in a process when people were expressing that? How, how would you deal with that? I think it's helpful, right? I think it's one of the things that it's one of the immediate things that cut, cuts through to someone um, to help them to empathize and see your what you feel. It's the the unfortunate part of that, though, as 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 effective as it might be to communicate it also comes with like an emotional cost sometimes, right? Um, when you say that, what do you mean? So it's like if something, if you're, if you're, so for instance, if there's a particular thing that cuts you and hurts you deeply and something that you just don't want to talk about, right? You kind of shut down your stone wall to avoid yourself, to protect yourself, essentially. You're protecting your, your actual emotions and your, your ego from, from that event um by talking about it you can kind of inflict pain on, on yourself again right so trauma for example yeah. you can be re-traumatized yeah yeah sure okay all right even, even you know sorry go ahead no you finish first and then we'll, <laughs> we'll transition with chris Ann. i was just gonna get a little little example like you have an issue let's say with a family member for instance and something that family member did really hurt you deeply you have specific reasons why that hurts you deeply, right? I think the societal expectation is that we kind of just like, hey, move on, no harm, no foul, but like your feelings are hurt. And to tell that person, hey, you know, you hurt my feelings when you did that. There is also that potential that, you know, you, you kind of relive that, that, that experience. And there's also like a potential that person might not respond in the way that you may hope, right? to kind of alleviate or to feel like they empathize with what you, what you did. But that's why well, mediators me, like you are fantastic to have in the room when you have those conversations. You know, it's about self-awareness. I'll put it back that, you know, that's, I think, a foundational skill for any human being to have. The capacity to be connected to your moments as they're happening, to see what is happening, to see what isn't happening, and then, you know, reflect on that and then try and identify a, a means to address what's not happening to try to build upon the relationship or connection or opportunity that you ideally want your goal with that and so it's a it's a process and it's a never-ending one from my perspective and having the foundation of self-awareness going from person to person interaction and interaction i think that's um you know, whether it comes out positive or productive, I think it's the effort and the intention that's of value for, for me, uh, because that is something I do deeply value. Chrisanne, do you have anything you want to share with regard to the myths and untruths that have become normalized for the men's perspective? Um. I would say, I'm trying to figure out how to put it. Maybe um, uh, there's no necessity to reflect. Um, so I guess the, the 
in terms of kind of men just going through the motions of life um where it's kind of it's it's similar to what roderick said um but men going through the the emotions of life without kind of stepping back to kind of reflect on who they are and who they would want to be more than just a few of the factors that kind of you're rewarded for in society um <clears throat> so the the myth would be that there's no need for a reflection for that however it if men don't kind of step back or have that space to step back or have that freedom to step back and kind of assess where they are not just career wise but who they are character wise um that affects relationships that uh, that does eventually affect their work that affects a number of things um so i just i think that's unhealthy um in terms of not having that not not necessarily not having that time but not making that time to come back and reflect on what's going on internally with you. So how would you, Chris Ann, with regard to the men in your circle, your sphere, your family, your relationships, mm -hmm. if you felt that there was something with regard to one of those people, mm -hmm. would you challenge them in some way about sharing or opening <laughs> up about what you perceive and understand? <laughs> See Roger's face. Um, yeah. Um, my mic now. <laughs> um, yes, I, I, like, I ask a lot of questions. Um, because I think it's important. And, but after a while, I think that also being like that makes it exhausting. Because I know I'm not the only kind of woman like that, where it's like, you, you have to ask like five different questions in order to kind of have this man really think about him, not even you but him, himself. Um, so I, I found that that's something that I, I guess it comes naturally now in general, because I am curious, I like talking to people, I like hearing what people have to say, but I find with men that, that sometimes the ease of the conversation or kind of asking those questions, it will even lead to some kind of defensiveness. They're like, what are you asking me? But it, sometimes even in hearing them say that, I realize that they don't even know how they feel. And it's kind of that, it's almost like a, it's almost like they ask this question in order to give themselves time to actually think. They can't say, oh, let me stop and think about it. It's just a question like, why are you asking me this? Or what do you mean? Those questions, because they really don't know how to either, they either well, don't know how to Yeah, they, it sounds like they struggle, with, they struggle with that because, you know, we talked about not having the glossary of terminology right. to self-express, let alone, then, then, the, then they say they buy time with these statements, mm -hmm. which are defensive mechanisms to deflect, move away from, or pass from, you just ask them something, so they're pushing it back on you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> How's your perspective on that, sir? Ah, my perspective on this. <laughs> yes, sir. As the other resident man. <laughs> yeah, you know, I agree. It's funny, Chris and I were, were talking the other day about like how I remember, um, <laughs> <laughs> about how sometimes we don't even like when we might ask you like oh what are you thinking about and you say nothing and this has ever happened to you where like nothing and then they're like what do you mean nothing that laugh says it has right and yeah. what i realized what i've come to realize over time and my, my, my um, partner and i talk about this is that like I, our some I think it's mostly socialization the way we, we kind of think sometimes as we might think of things like there's oversimplification that men are so simple and like you know where we just like or we just need the basic minimum of things but I think what it is really is that you don't we have less things to worry about in general not to say the things that we do worry about are not important 
or we communicate that we have less to say? Well, so I'll give you an example. Good, good point. So I might be looking out the window and she's like, what are you thinking about? I'm like, nothing. And what was communicated to me, like women would tend to think like there's all, they're always thinking of a lot of things. Like imagine a computer, uh, a browser with like multiple tabs open at the same time, right? And sometimes I'm like, I might just be looking at the cloud because it just has a funny shape. And I'm just drifting and not even think, like, I'm really thinking about nothing significant all the times. And like, they may have multiple tabs <laughs> open. It's like, hey, we're like, an ability to multitask also might be more significant, right? Um, happened today, we're working out. My wife was explaining the workout. And then I was like, sorry, just drifted off. <laughs> right? <laughs> And Chrisanne's shaking her head because Chrisanne's like, how? Like, this, this doesn't seem possible. Oh, well, when you make oh it... it's painful. I know that feeling. But yeah. <laughs> but what it really is, is like, I think a lot of it is just a, a woman's ability to process multiple things. I think that's more of a superpower. And we mislabel it sometimes in society as like, oh, someone's being dramatic or crazy. Um, but like, if you've ever been in an environment, and if you think about our places in society where like, we have our physical safety isn't threatened or compromised mm -hmm. as much, right? Maybe our emotional safety might be, but if you've ever been in a situation where your emotional safety is compromised, you're always on hyper alert and hyper drive. And it's like, imagine feeling like what I realized that like, I feel like some women feel that way all the time, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Where it's like, Hey, I gotta, I, I have to feel an emotional and, and, and um, safety nest to, to be in this particular area. So I think sometimes we don't even think about how we're feeling because we don't have um, a lot of those obstacles until something happens where we're like, all right, this is making me feel a little bit anxious. How do I respond in this particular moment? And um, like you said, practice. We don't practice enough having those conversations amongst ourselves um, or generally in society. So it's gonna be difficult when, our, when your partner comes to you and say, says to do something um, or ask you how you feel about something when you're like, wow, I haven't even taken that assessment in myself first to figure out how it does, right? It really has a lot to do with tools that you have available um, at, your, at, your, at your disposal to use. So how do you see men as being their worst enemies? You know, someone said the other day, sorry, because I want to say this quickly, that men are the prisoners and prison guards of patriarchy. So it's like, there's this thing that we, we have, we play an active role in upholding patriarchy, right? Like we might judge or criticize another guy or make fun of other guys, right? For, for things like, um, but also we don't benefit from it in that way because we are held captive to it, right? Or we keep ourselves captive to it. Yeah. Because we just don't want to acknowledge it. We don't want to validate it. We don't feel that it you know it, it would be valued and you know whatever that means or where that's come from it's conditions of society and you know uh th there's many who would say that society has been a construct of the male mindset yeah like when's practice. the last time you told your guy like yo i love you bro you know it's it's <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not something that we, we, we might say in a regular basis, but uh, I guarantee you every guy you know wants to feel loved. Or wants to feel like someone's thinking of me and, and loves me and respects me, like, you know? Yeah. But sometimes that, if someone, someone says that, you're like, oh, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> hey, you hey, hey, let's have some boundaries here. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of this reinforcement of the uh, stigma. Do you have any thoughts on uh, Chris Ann? this piece um well i was gonna say earlier in terms of just processing i think that um going back to one of roger's points i was trying to explain the other day sometimes if women can't zone out in terms of certain things like men do just in terms of safety right um we'd love to <laughs> we'd love to but um, we can't necessarily do that. If I, if I push back at you and when you say you can't, that's the well, mindset that you're reinforcing for yourself. Right. 
but okay so i'll give you an example which so i would love to sit up and look at the clouds and not think of anything um or i would love to go for a walk outside but there have been times where i've done that and i've kind of zoned out and then when i zone back in i realize that somebody's following me so in those moments it's like you're always on high alert versus kind of if if there is a another man there you might be on less alert if you trust him right um so i think there's in terms of going back to the way how society would be built around patriarchy it's on it's unfortunate that maybe it's unfortunate that that kind of awareness or alertness isn't kind of built in for men to or socialized in men um because i think that would also lead to greater understanding between men and women and men and other men so what what role does culture or ethnicity play with regard to how the perceptions and the realities of men's mental health is Um, so, I would just say in general, um, we touched on it a little bit, but um, if we look at, um, I would say, going back as far as slavery um, and the justification of, you know, treating Black bodies a certain way, it's like they can take more, more pain or they don't feel it. And we see those things creep up into different parts of society right and so while i think in a way that does affect um people of color and more specifically i'll say um black men or black women um i do think in terms of that there's the added um realm of masculinity that idea of masculinity that Kind of attaches itself onto that so say for a black man it might be double <laughs> that where it's kind of like society feels like oh he feels no pain um or in general with men like you feel nothing so then it's kind of like as a black man you you're numb or you can take it or you're built to take it or um you know that might um translate into people maybe feeling like certain people are better for certain types of jobs, harder work because, and then relegating them to that work, um, that type of work. But I, I think it has, it, it has a lot to do with it. I also think that in general, um, as Roderick was saying before, like even the language being limited for men in general, you get into certain communities where, you know, men feel like they have to be tough or they have to be the provider. So on top of that, not only do you have the men that that masculine factor of being, um, you know, tough and not worrying and bearing the burdens and, but then in terms of ethnicity, it's like you have an added um area there where it's like well you don't talk about this men don't talk about those things so then it gets into kind of a double time again um so i think yeah i think ethnicity has a lot to do with it also kind of the stigmas in terms of going to get help um, so i want i yeah thank you i want rod right Eric to respond first though as a comment in the uh section chat absolutely agreed every man man person wants to feel loved the manner in which this is, the society has constructed that showing of love is different it's almost like one needs to hear it feel it more than the other which is not the case you know that was referenced you rod eric you talked mm -hmm. about the uh, men want to want to hey i want to be loved too just like any other human being yeah yeah, their, their basic needs that that kind of go unfulfilled uh, mm -hmm. due to just uh, the way that we 
construct and the way that we have been taught to to relate to each other right you know if if like growing up you're hearing on on like from a black male's perspective i'm not sure how how it went down in your hood greg but <laughs> if you know if if you fall and you, and you cry and then someone might tell you hey boys don't cry what are you doing right um and even just as it's 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 necessary sometimes you you learn that it's necessary from a survival perspective right um to be tough and and um and aggressive but it's interesting i went to an all boys school when i was back home in antigua and it is like the on one perspective is like the the smartest men in it's a post it's a secondary school it's like a high school it's like and you have to have like certain amount of grades to get in and you know that you know there's a correlation between sometimes the grades that you get and the resources that you have so you have people sometimes who have like some of the most you know affluent sometimes uh, privileged the, individuals yeah but even just form. regularly just smart okay there's this additional layer because it's an all guy school it's a hyper just hyper alpha <laughs> kind of environment like mm. where we if, it, if we were bored just fight for fun if there was like exams come like you know the time after exams where there's the, the uh, teachers are just busy marking and they're not really going to class just fights will just break out all the time right and it's just like this thing that you kind of just tested you, each other but you know so that's one environment where you have to be kind of strong uh, or perceived strong to kind of survive in that environment but also coming here to canada and then dealing with just other things microaggressions racism and then you're like oh you have to also have that additional layer of of and project, project that additional layer of strength um which great you know you, you survive another day and i think even chris ann talked about like um even the basis in coming from slavery the basis socially that we're still functioning in where we're kind of in survival mode at certain times but what happens is really we're kind of we're kind of lagging socially in some of the things that are acceptable right whereas it may be more acceptable for guys um to show emotions like my 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 white friends they're so free <laughs> they talk <laughs> about like their feelings and like even like going, like to going to like therapy and all that kind of stuff in a free way that we're still not there yet in society we're getting we're catching up but it's not there yet um where it's something that's that's very open so that's the the you know the further impact that Chrisan was sharing about the double layer that yeah. the culture also imposes on itself and then society also the broader the mainstream the majority white individuals who try to say that their standard is the standard for all mm -hmm. not acknowledging that there are people of different lived experiences and culturally religious etc that may have a differing perspective of that and so it's not considered of trying to acknowledge that to even include that to make change within society and systems that are mm -hmm. about creating inclusivity so there's you know you tell me if i'm wrong it's feeling like on the outs for yourself in some way yeah one of the, i read a very my undergrad i read a very interesting um like stats that like black communities mental health is much lower in those communities and other communities and it's something i really i used to look at it i used to take at face value i'm like oh like you know we can handle things more and then what i realized also was just from the resources that there are less we might we not we may not access um some of those resources for mental health professionals and if you don't access them then you're not counted right so it's not accounting for the many people that are going um, without that um, support, it could be resources financially, like it's not cheap, you know, therapy is great, but it's not always affordable. Mm -hmm. um, and then also when you're dealing with shortages of mental health professionals, but you may think that I don't know if that person who's gonna, I'm going to be sitting across from can relate to me in my experiences as a person. And that is also a barrier of accessing uh, mental health resources in the system.
yeah, and it's a catch-22 in some ways because if individuals are not accessing resources, again, we talk about the constructs of why they're not. It's just that the fact that they're not, that's not recorded statistically with the data, yeah. would then would go to the policymakers to say, no, we don't need to invest in that area because there's no demand for it. Yeah. And it goes so, back to that myth that like, hey, they don't need it. Like they're good, you know, where, where it's like, we need it the most. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's the whole thing about looking below the waterline to see the realities of people's lived experiences and not just keeping ourselves on the surface. Uh, we don't have much time left. I do want to talk about how to reframe the narrative on this. What are your thoughts with regard to that? Chris Ann. Reframe on, uh, on men's mental health in general? Yeah, and then well, however you want to process that statement, whether you want to keep it on the surface with society overall or connected with uh, black individuals and culture or not, that's up to you. Um, you don't need my permission. <laughs> um, while I don't want to generalize, I think that um, maybe if the communication, if if the ne necessity of um, <clears throat> communication from men was more of a thing was more in demand it was more required which is which is happening um i would say it's changing um it will eventually lead to healthier men so instead of seeing it as just you know uh men's mental health a general everybody needs the space to communicate um i know there are studies that talk about um, stress, for example, and how when you don't express certain things, like you actually, your body actually starts to get sick, right? Um, and a part of your body is your mental health. So I think just in terms of that demand, if it would be normalized that men need to communicate, men need to embrace what they're feeling, not just as men, but people in general need to do those things in order to maintain overall health in turn and seeing that mental health as part of overall health um that's what i would kind of say um just demanding that more how would you demand that um <laughs> hmm. uh one one area could be relationships. And I think that's happening a little bit more in terms of men wanting men, to, sorry, not men, women wanting men to be more open and not just for the relationship, but for themselves as well. Because obviously, you know, two healthy people can have a healthier relationship, right? Um, so, I mean, so I guess changing, changing the rules around certain things relationships could be one of them um, in terms of how you, parenthood could be one of them. How do you raise your boys? Um, so I would say that's kind of how you demand it, changing the rules around that. Your perspective, uh, brother? Yeah, as we wrap up, I just want to really just give a shout out to all the guys out there, all the boys, all the man them who are really prioritizing <laughs> their, their mental health because things are shifting, right? And I think that what I realized is that that expectation of us just to be financial providers and kind of have this distant relationship with all partners is no longer, um, it is no longer the norm it's shifting increasingly where we have to be more involved um emotionally involved and uh present because um women have access to more options now they have more 
you know, they don't need in, in, as, as much as they used to historically your financial resources, right? And what I'm seeing for a lot of my friends, my, my homegirls, they're just like, they just want a guy who loves them, right? It's not, you don't even have to have, you know, making six figures or any of that kind of stuff. It's like someone who can like listen, who loves, appreciates them, right? And I think, so the pendulum is, is swinging a bit. And I think in the long run, it just makes it better, right? Um, for the relationships that we have and that we keep, right? Because they're outliving us, guys. And sometimes they're outliving us just because just they, they're just prioritizing um, some things that we take for granted. And, and we're not think, acknowledging for ourselves yeah. as a, a responsibility for yeah. everything. And the paradox, too, that I'm hearing is that, you know, we talked about men having, quote, the uh, traditional uh, control, if you want to call it, of society overall. And that in terms of, you know, politicians and the, the CEOs, the decision makers, yeah. and the policy makers for that. And so there's investment in women's mental health in some form and lived experiences, yet the men who have control are not looking to invest in their own mental health. Mm -hmm. but, and the cheat, but the cheat code really is, if, if you are a person who you are already ambitious and you have those other things that traditionally made you um, a, a great partner, for instance, and you're emotionally aware and self-aware and have that emotional intelligence, man, that is the... <laughs> That is, that is the cheat code. Am I lying, Chrisanne? Well, <laughs> um, I, I can't disagree with you yeah. there. Um, but I, I think it's, it's a matter of not seeing that as a bad thing. Because I yeah. think that, like, in general, the being emotionally aware, being, you know, you know, high on the communication scale is seen as a thing, like, it's not a good thing for men. And I, and I don't think that's the case. I think in general, this might lead to healthier men. It's not saying that, you know, all of us don't have the propensity to be tough at some point in time, but there's a time where you kind of have to lay back, peel away the layers, let it out, and then move on. <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 the do the word resilient to be able to navigate through your lived experiences and take something from it and reframe it into from a negative or perceived negative into a positive to, you know, go from a survivor to actually be a thriver where you take mm -hmm. the lived experiences of starting as a victim survivor, and then the thriver where you can make something more productive and invest in your own life and others lives as well. So uh, there's a comment um, or a question. What Chris Ann was suggesting in my view, it is so, it is for the health of men too, not just for their partner. Because mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's the part of a relationship. And then another comment, the root of this issue is generational. And opening up this conversation will no doubt lead to meaningful change. I mean, change, so we've always, I've always presented, and I know a lot of other people do, that the idioms of talk is cheap. We say about something, yet we don't follow through with putting something, a plan of action, putting it into play to make the actual change that you so desire. And I think that's the next step. We can talk about it and agitate the conversations that go there. I think we have to invest and be intentional to try to create the change that we're seeking to make. Yeah. So, uh, in basically going to a closing perspective here, what would each of you like to share? Let's uh, talk with uh, Rod Eric first, and we'll give. Uh, I would like to the share last word to DMX. Um, what was that? Sorry. I would like to share rest in peace, DMX. That is, you know, I, I feel like it's very in line with the conversation we're having today about men and mental health, and. Um, it is, it's so sad. It's like a lot of times we turn to things that <clears throat> like substances instead, instead of like, you know, finding our healthier ways to kind of uh, address our, our issues. 
I'm not talking about him in particular, I'm just seeing general for Skies, mm-hmm. but like he was just a very brilliant person and uh, I'll be remiss if I didn't mention how impactful and, and talented and brilliant uh, and he only, was. Only 50 years of age. Only, yeah, it's, yeah, sad. And I just wanted to acknowledge the microphone that you have, uh, <laughs> you have uh, blessed yourself with in some way. It has, my, my wife bought it for me, so uh, thank you. Thank you, sweetheart, for, for doing that. <laughs> and um, final well, that's thing good. I will that, say. That's, that's very good of you to acknowledge because that's, that's healthy. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it, Greg. <laughs> sure. Love you, bro. <laughs> Chris Ann, what's your uh, perspective on uh, transitioning off to uh, end the show? Um, I think. I think I don't necessarily have anything to add from my last point. I think that just agreeing with what Roderick said in terms of, you know, choosing a healthier way to kind of deal with those issues. Oh, and um, also not seeing it, not seeing mental health as an issue when a crisis happens. See it as maintenance. You go to the gym and you kind of try to maintain your physique or, you, you know, whatever it is, it might not be the gym, but, um, you know, instead of just seeing it as like, oh my gosh, I need to go when there's a crisis. Um, no, it's just part of your daily maintenance of life. And that's it. Normalizing it being a part of every day. Yeah. I mean, it's to, to say it's exceptional. At the same time to say, hey, it's not exceptional because these are live realities for most of us. And let's talk about it and then take it to a further step of doing something constructive, productive with it to create the change that we're so feeling that's lacking. And I just want to acknowledge too from uh, the comments, uh, I'm so glad to start to follow this program. Uh, I won't name the person. I know who the person is because I haven't gotten his permission. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, he is a, a student with a current certificate in family mediation. Nice. And thank you. This was a great discussion, a start and a move towards healthy change. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. So uh, we'll get this edited through the uh, team of... Uh, Tarsia and uh, Goldberg and go from there. I do want to put a shout out to acknowledge uh, Kathy Ann on her uh, upcoming birthday. Uh, Happy birthday, shout- Kathy Ann. Happy birthday. Okay. And um, thank you each, Chris Ann and Roderick, for you know being patient to transition yourself from the radio to being here and all the what happened and with COVID and I would welcome an opportunity for a return conversation about something again, provocative because I'm not into the routine, the mundane. Thank you for having us, Greg. And it's, lo- it's <laughs> great to see your lovely bookshelf in the back of you. And, and this is just a cue for anyone listening um, in audio. You can should check out the video too. It's, it's, um, it's wonderful. You, you get to see. Oh. Well, I see that, you know, if, if only we could tap into book your shelves and plants. Book, bookshelf and plants. see what, what <laughs> books plants. you put on. What books are you putting on your shelf? How oh. does that connect with how you identified, brother? You know, the book, uh, there's a book I started, I just bought, Adam Grant. It's called Think Again, and it's like rethinking things that you thought about before. So it ties into this conversation where we thought how we traditionally think about masculinity and where we're rethinking. Um, what that looks like and are the assumptions that we made correct Hmm. Mm -hmm. so challenging tradition status quo whatever is to you know to create for the change that we so badly feel needed anyways thank you for the two of you appreciate the time thank you for having us thanks for having us Greg okay so everybody if there's no final comments Coming from the bleacher seats, the crowd, we're going to say good night and tap in next week, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.